president of the Commission uh, Appellation and Communication at the Comité Champagne, um, Vincent Perrin, who is the managing director, and uh, Thibault Le Mayou, director of communications. Um, 2015 has been an amazing year for Champagne, and we all thrilled about it. Let me close the door. Um, it's been a very good year in the UK as well, because um, as uh, our friends will talk to you about it, uh, the figures in terms of volume and value are up. So uh, over to you. And I think that we are going to start with some digital news. So thank you very much for being here with us. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us this morning for a little update of the situation in Champagne. As Francois just said, it's more comfortable to come with good news than, of course, if we had to, to give less good news. Uh, but uh, I am sure that in our presentation today, you will find one or two little surprises. Um, here is the uh, different themes we are going to talk about. And the uh, first point I would like to mention is, uh, is not, nothing really new because it goes back to last July, but it's the uh, UNESCO uh, classification of uh, champagne uh, vineyards, cellars, and uh, maisons. Uh, that gives me an opportunity to pay a tribute to my late friend uh, Pierre Cheval, because you may uh, know that this is uh, this long road to classification, to recognition by UNESCO was uh, launched by uh, this very commission. Uh, I was already, I was president of this commission and Pierre was the vice president. And soon the UNESCO subject became um, a, a, a almost full-time subject in itself. So he resigned as a, as a vice president of, of, of the Appellation Commission to take over the UNESCO project. Uh, sadly, as you know, he had a, a heart attack uh, recently and he did, died very brutally in his uh, young age of 65, relatively young age of 65, too young anyway to go. So I would just like to say hello Pierre and thank you. Um, we are going to cover um, a few subjects, but directly related to that, I would like to immediately uh, ask Vincent Perrin uh, some of you have already met Vincent several times because he has joined CIBC a couple of years ago. Uh, so, uh, was your I started this year. Started this year. Okay. Well, was my third year. We don't see time go up. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. Well, most of you have known, uh, of course, uh, Jean Luc Barbier, who has been serving uh, Champagne Committee and Champagne, Champagne Wines for so long. Now happily retired, and uh, so Vincent took over. Yes. So Vincent, one of the first things you, well, you did many things when you arrived at CIVC, of course, but one of the interesting things immediately after the uh, UNESCO recognition, you developed with your service with Thibault this Champion 2016. What is that exactly? Yeah, well, thank you very much, uh, Bruno. Uh, we're going through a checklist uh, just to feed the conversation, so I'm going to go very quickly. Uh, I, will, I will comment very quickly upon this UNESCO uh, heritage issue. It was very good news in Champaign and uh, it was a very big celebration for us because it's a result of uh, eight years of work, of hard work to manage uh, uh, first uh, the recognition by the French government to be candidate for France uh, for the UNESCO uh, uh, classification, World Heritage classification. And then, of course, it was a, a final fight to get the recognition, the unanimous recognition of the uh, on the 4th of July 2015. Uh, there was a time for celebration, but now there is a time for hard work on the basis of this uh, promise, this new promise that Champagne is making to the rest of the world that we are uh, engaged, committed to uh, not only the conservation, the perfect conservation of this heritage, which is recognized as unique and uh, exceptional, but also to, uh, to, to 
make it as lively as possible and to share the best experience uh, of the territory uh, in which we produce the uh, Chapek wines. Uh, it was very meaningful for us, first because it was a recognition by the United Nations that Chapek really comes from Chapek. Uh, second, uh, because there is a high potential, including in the UK, for wine tourism in Champagne, and uh, it's, a, it's a new strategy of territorial marketing, we would say, uh, to add this supplement of soul to uh, the Champagne product. And we're working very hard on it, uh, on the basis of the refinement, uh, the history, uh, and the also the result of uh, eight years investment in gastronomy and uh, uh, in the food sector in, uh, in the territory. That's also very important. And uh, we are at the center of this process uh, as a champagne committee. And third, because uh, we ch this UNESCO uh, World Heritage is also uh, uh, hard work on human social sciences to work on proof that we have intangible assets, and these intangible assets have a strong value when we speak about champagne. So this is for all these reasons that it's very important, and we wanted this to uh, not only to be uh, to, to look backwards and to look at the heritage, but also to share this heritage and to share it with the uh, newest technologies. And this is why we have developed uh, 360 champagne. We may have tried it on your cell phone, but the best experience, and this is what we offer here in London, is uh, an experience with glasses, and through this lens, you can be immersed wherever you are, even on the moon, if you go to the moon, you can uh, feel as if you were in Champagne, in the vineyards of Champagne, or visiting the cellars of Champagne, and this is very important for us to, to share this uh, with the global audience of Champagne. This audience is further and further from the territory. Of course, it's in the UK, uh, but it's also, as we're going to see uh, afterwards, in the United States, uh, in Japan, uh, further and further. And this is why we need to develop these tools to share this very important knowledge and data and information and experience uh, of Champagne. Uh, we turn back to yeah. which Vincent, which by the way you can experience upstairs because we have a desk as you go up uh, next yeah. registration and you can experience it if you have some time. There's a lady there who will help you. She's waiting for you. With, on waiting on for you. On yes. And we have we have yes. a special kind of spectacles. Yes. It's it's quite spectacular. I really invite you to try it. Fabien, <laughs> bueno. Well, coming back to what happened in 2015. Um, First, uh, uh, just a little reminder of the key figures. You can see that the surface under vine has not uh, evolved at all. Uh, you are all aware of this uh, old project of uh, the uh, reconstitution of some of the 19th century vineyards, uh, because uh, 150 years ago, there were twice as much vineyard in Champagne, inside Champagne, as there is now. But as you know, even though this project started in 1995, it will take another, probably another 10 or 15 years before we can see figures where a more surface will be planted. That is to say, of course, that this process is a long process because it's based on two major aspects. First aspect, those claiming for being reproduced inside the Champagne must show historical uh, proof that it was actually planted in vineyards of 19th century before phylloxera. Point one and point two, there are a lot of technical factors have to be recognized by a commission composed of university people who must sign that they have absolutely no interest in Champagne. So, I, I, I mean, personally, I don't even know their names, just to show you how, uh, how, how uh, objective it must be from the the, the, the growers or the producers. Um, so we are still with the, about 34,000 hectares. I think in acres it makes something like 50,000 acres. I am not quite sure of the conversion, but anyway. 
the number of growers is uh, a little increasing, but that's, that's due to many uh, divisions of properties or succession, you know, heritage. So we are now closer to 16,000, when we always traditionally said 15,000. In reality, it's a little more now. Through the years, a couple of hundred are arriving. Um, among these, uh, 400, 400, 400 half thousand are what we call récoltant manipulant, uh, some being uh, actually producing champagne at home, others being producing champagne through their cooperative. There are 320 maisons, even if you probably know no more than maybe 30 or 50, which is normal because lots of them are very small. You know that the property of the vineyard is concentrated among the growers more than in, in the maisons, hence the importance of the kilo price for the grapes and the uh, importance of uh, pluriannual contracts. Uh, there is a, a very important loyalty between the, the, the maisons and their growers. Um, some contracts are going on for more than 50 years, even if officially they are only for three years, but they are renewed. 99% are renewed with the same growers. The maisons own a little, only about uh, 10 to 11 percent of the surface in Champagne. I remind you that this region is producing a quite expensive kilo of grape with a quite limited yield per hectare because we are talking about 10,000 kilo per hectare, sometimes 11,000, something like that. It's more or less the, the average, and uh, an average price between uh, five and uh, six, seven, and sometimes well over for some very particular Grand Cru, uh, euro per kilo. And you need 1.2 kilo to produce one bottle. Hmm? OK. Voilà. Très bien. Um, next. Of course, we will be happy to answer questions after, so don't, don't, don't hesitate. But I'm just maybe conducting a uh, quick, quick survey. This, in terms of surface, represents only 0.4% of the surface of vineyard in the world, and a little less than 4% of the French vineyard. So Champagne is a smaller region in, in size. Sometimes I see Champagne described as a giant. It's just ridiculous, at least in terms of size. When it comes to turnover, it's another story. I agree with you, because of obviously, if Champagne Wines represent probably today less than 10% uh, of the world of sparkling wine in terms of volume. Then, of course, it's clear that Champagne represents certainly more than 55% of the of the ex cellar turnover. Uh, Champagne is a large exporter, although we don't always know that. Almost half of the production, of the volume production, is drunk in France. It's actually drunk in France. But, but it's about half of it which is exported, and that represents 30% uh, of the value of the exported French wines. Okay, uh, so the next slide uh, gives you the, uh, uh, the profile of the 2015 harvest. When you see uh, the volume, you realize that it's, uh, it's close to replacing the sales. It's, 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 it's only a few million bottles less than the volume of sales. So we could qualify 2015 harvest in terms of volume. We could qualify it of well-balanced. In terms of quality, it's very interesting. We have a beautiful state of health of the grapes with a fairly high maturity combined with a, with a very good acidity. So the balance is, is interesting. We are not like in 96 where you had a 10 on 10, of course. It's halfway between a, uh, I would say it's, it's more in a, what we could call a classical great vintage. Those of you who have uh, had an opportunity to start putting your nose on the Van Clairs, you, you, you have seen, I am sure, some quite interesting things, even if today. Most Pinot Noir, are the, uh, my point of view, are not yet open, but the Chardonnays, for instance, are already showing extremely well. Uh, and they, I'm no doubt that in, in one month or two, they, 
it will be possible to have a, a fantastic view of the of the quality of the of the base wines of the 2015 uh, harvest uh, and. Uh, I mean, I don't think I take too much risk in, in saying that some producers will declare it a vintage. Uh, but as you know, the production of vintage champagne is small, but, uh, so you don't need to take all of the, of the grapes to create a vintage. But uh, there is no doubt that 2015 will be declared a vintage by most producers. Uh, the um, global update and uh, economic point of view is that uh, it's not always uh, it's not always uh, easy in Champagne. We uh, have uh, suffered of the 2008 recession. Uh, sales was uh, were, were picking up uh, in 2010 when we had the second part of this recession hitting again. And so uh, every time the movements are not violent, as you can see, Champagne is has a very strong following, but. Uh, uh, we have not yet rec recovered our 2007 uh, record figures. The uh, global inventory in Champagne today is just over three and a half year of inventory, which is good for quality, particularly because what is in the cellars is of extremely high quality level. We have no, uh, we don't have the same problem as there were once. I mean, long ago, with vintages like uh, 72 or 84, which were really uh, problems. Since uh, 1984, we have had only good to very good years. We did, did not have anything uh, uh, below average in terms of in terms of, 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 of high level of quality. Um, when it comes to export country, to export markets, in volume, export markets. Represent a little more, a little sorry, a little less than, than half of the champagne sales, while in value it represents more than half the champagne sales. So today we are going to introduce for the first time in this annual presentation a little uh, an extra slide which will show you the exports, not just in volume but also in value. And uh, I think that would be maybe interesting for you because here, here is the difference. So. Uh, your, your American fellows are just passing before uh, the UK, so we must react next year. <laughs> uh, no, come back please to the previous one with the volume, because it's, come, it's very important to, re, to remind you uh, that the UK is an extremely uh, strong following for Champagne, and that uh, you will have a focus on the UK market after but uh, there is still a great loyalty from the British customers for Champagne. But what it shows is that also, and it's interesting maybe to, to, to look at that, at that uh, fact, is that in fact the UK is a big drinker of, of uh, as we call it, non-vintage Champagne. I don't like this wording for two reasons. First, because it is negative. Second, because it means nothing. I prefer to call these wines multi-vintage, uh, which I think is more precisely describing what it is, but anyway, whether, whatever way we call it, it shows that the UK doesn't seem to be a, a big market for vintage champagne or some of the more expensive cuvées, which explains the reason why on the next side, slide you see that America has now, is now before the UK. But it's not the only, uh, maybe little surprise, because what you see also, is that, for instance, Japan is, not, Japan is behind uh, Germany in volume, but it's before, it's ahead of Germany in volume. And uh, you have the same phenomenon between Australia and Italy, for instance. Australia is before Italy in volume, but it's behind Italy in value. So, the main explanation is totally inside what we call the product mix, that is to say, whatever QV each country buys more. Uh, so this is a little surprise I was talking about because I am I, I suspect that many many of us did not uh, many of us did not really know that before. Of course, we as producers we know very well where where we sell which wine, uh, but uh, I think that that may become as a surprise to some of you. And of course, if there are some questions, we can we are happy to answer these questions after. Um, last uh, point I would like to uh, 
say about uh, precisely the product mix. But this slide uh, now that you see, uh, of course, covers uh, the entire export market. So uh, there, it's but what you can guess from this, from what we just said before, is that these slides would be extremely different from one country to the other, which is the explanation why classifying by volume doesn't give the same result as classifying by turnover. Uh, so the average production, of course, is dominated by what we call not vintage, or again, I prefer called multi-vintage, which is uh, over 80%. It's a very different uh, uh, breakdown if you look at countries like America, Japan, or Italy, where, of course, then you would see that prestige cuvée, or vintage champagne, or even rosé, are taking much bigger <coughs> market shares. Voila, it's the difference between value and volume. You can uh, obviously understand that the small 4% volume prestige cuvée uh, has a weight of nearly 15%. Of course, this is where it is the most spectacular. But uh, again, I maybe Vincent will tell us a little more. Uh, Let's refocus in the UK market. Focus in the UK. Uh, yeah, I mean, speak in the microphone. Uh, so, f of course, as you see, there is champagne is on the move, and there are some moves in the global landscape for the champagne market. But, uh, maybe look at the UK market in itself. Uh, champagne is here, it's well here. There are cycles in the champagne economy, but uh, as far as there is a recovery, global, uh, an overall e economic recovery, champagne is back, champagne is here. And uh, uh, this is part of the champagne economic strategy to look for steady growth, to look for resilience. And this is also the way we want to, to manage our appellation. Uh, so, if you will look at uh, the figures, the UK accounts for a uh, large part of the, of the growth in the European Union. Uh, globally, the European Union has grown 3.3% uh, in volume and 6% in value. Uh, in the UK, it's plus 4.5% in volume and 7.3% in value. Uh, so we are back to five. When we look at uh, the value uh, figures, so it's 34 percent, 34 million bottles uh, uh, sent to, to the to the UK, which is still less than 2005 or 2006, uh, but a very uh, interesting dynamics in volumes and even better uh, in value with uh, uh, the total turnover. Excellers uh, next net of tax impact in euros of uh, 512 million euros. So the champion is part of the uh, sparkling dynamics in the UK. Uh, and the uh, champion is here, uh, clearly. Uh, if you look at the average price, the average price is also growing, also in value. And you, if you look at the next uh, uh, slide, you can see that uh, the growth in the UK, the growth uh, of the average price is uh, less than the growth uh, of the total turnover and, uh, uh, and the growth of the volume, which means that there is, there is also a mix effect in the UK, uh, which is, and uh, we can, you, you can turn back to the um, Sorry, I will go directly there because it's interesting. There is a slight, uh, so if you look at the multi-vintage, the, 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 um, the proportion of multi-vintage in the UK is a little higher than the average uh, of the world. Uh, Prestige cuvées uh, are doing well, but Rosé, for example, is still a little lagging behind in the UK. Uh, uh, the market for Rosé in the US is 15 more is 18% of uh, our sales, and uh, in uh, Germany it's 15%. So it's, there is also an interesting mix, mix effect uh, uh, that can characterize also the, uh, the UK market. Uh, if you look at uh, the profile of the 
of the champagne uh, uh, operators, I would say. You can see that uh, you have a total of 386 operators selling to the UK. Uh, you can compare it with the US where you have already uh, more than 450 operators uh, try exporting more or less to the US market. Uh, so a little less competitors, but still it's a lot uh, globally with 100, uh, 149 uh, houses. Uh, last year it was 140 houses. In 2014, there was a decrease, a slight decrease. There is a, a, an increase of the number of houses selling to the UK. Uh, the number of growers going to the UK market is growing from 205 to 216, uh, and it was growing last year. Uh, stability of the number of cooperatives, 21 cooperatives. Uh, so with a total number of 386 as compared with 367, so there's a little more competition on the UK market uh, than last year. Uh, this is what I wanted to say on the, the UK market, of course we can come back uh, during the conversation. Uh, I just wanted to conclude on uh, the need for Champagne to have collective challenges. These collective challenges are very strong drivers for our value strategy. Uh, we, we introduced a conversation with one of them, which is the heritage issue. The second issue, which is very important, is the environmental leadership we want to, uh, to have. Champagne is clearly on the move. We have made uh, progress over the last 15 years with results on uh, sustainable viticulture issues. We've been the first region, one region in the world to uh, start 10 years ago uh, uh, climate uh, and carbon, uh, carbon strategy. We have reduced our carbon footprint by 15% uh, over the last 10 years. It means that we have been one of the economic sectors in Europe in which we have had a growth, some growth, and at the same time we have reduced our carbon footprint collectively. And we want to make sure that this is a real collective strife. We don't want to make, of course, there are pioneers, uh, there are followers, but we want to make sure that everybody is engaged into the same collective work of making sure that uh, within the next 10 years, we can uh, really achieve good results in uh, sustainable viticulture. We are 100% committed to sustainable viticulture and our certification we've launched uh, uh, last year has been approved by the French Ministry of Agriculture at the highest level of environmental certification in last April. And we are now working, we have already managed that 10% of the surface of Champagne has achieved this certification, but already one third of the growers, and we have a lot of growers, as you know, uh, more than uh, um, 19,000 uh, growers uh, declaring, uh, uh, yes, according to what we count, uh, you have, you have uh, 16,000 or 19,000, a lot of actors, and uh, already half of them have gone through uh, training and information about uh, sustainable viticulture. So we are really fighting with the cooperatives, with the houses, and it's really part of our DNA now to look uh, for uh, progress, collective progress uh, on uh, sustainable viticulture. Uh, a 50% reduction in the use of uh, uh, vine protection products, uh, which is a good achievement. As you know, at a national level in France, it's plus 5%. So what we have achieved was exactly what the, the target the French government has achieved, uh, as I wanted to meet uh, when they launched the Ecofito program uh, uh, 10 years ago. Uh, so we have done that, and uh, this is a result of this collective work. Uh, so this is uh, the second collective, and the, uh, the third collective target is really uh, uh, turn, turning champagne digital and uh, having a strong digital communication strategy, uh, including something, uh, an issue that is uh, key to the champagne committee strategy, which is 
uh, training uh, awareness strategy. Uh, we already manage physically to train and, uh, and uh, uh, around 3,000 people all around the world. These are network of agencies all over the world. We have counted the people we try to through. Uh, physical testing and training all over the world, it's around 3,000 people. When we launched Champagne Campus, our strategy was to add a first tier of our strategy, which would be digital and which would, which would reach more than 10 times the number of people we are able to, to reach physically, actively. And this is what we have managed uh, with Champagne Campus, which is first a website, which is an e-learning website, uh, with a, a, a little add-on, which is a, a small uh, app, which is a game, a quiz. Uh, funny enough to engage with newcomers in the champagne world. I don't know if you've tried it. Uh, you can do it very easily. We can make a match. I may lose. <laughs> uh, but that's, uh, and that's very important for us. And with uh, the news was that I launched it in Hong Kong. Uh, in Chinese language at the same time as we launched it uh, in English and we are going to manage to have it in eight languages uh, within the next uh, months, I don't know, maybe early next year, I don't know, we, we, we are currently translating it in Spanish, Portuguese and Russian, uh, so it's really, uh, we need a global strategy, we, 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 we cannot start with French, we need to, to, to use all the languages in which uh, uh, our global audiences speak at the same time. This is what we are working on. Thank you very much. So thank you, thank you uh, to all of you. Uh, I'm sure you have questions. Or not. <laughs> so Ch Champagne Campus, I really invite you all to try it, to, to pay a visit to the, to the, to the website. Uh, well, it's more than a website, but it's really it's really interesting. It's been, it's been a good success. I mean, the app has been downloaded in the UK. It's been a, a huge success, mm -hmm. uh, recognized as a very yeah. useful uh, by consumers. We have some very yeah. good feedback about that. Um, Jane. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to ask, how do you, on the Champagne campus, how do you separate the novices, enthusiasts, and lovers? Because that suggests that enthusiasts and novices are not Champagne lovers. Can answer <laughs> Thank you for the difficult question. Uh, we've been hesitating a lot uh, on the on the phrasing, basically, of the app, and we felt uh, we need you needed some knowledge in order to deserve to be among the best lovers of champagne. Uh, so we we went for those for this vocabulary, but the most important thing is to try it, and uh, there are filtering questions at the beginning, which will determine your level. So you're not actually uh, a candidate to uh, any type of level. And you also are able to start at any le level if you wish anyway. So it's, uh, there's some freedom uh, to um, self-qualify yourself as a lover if you wish. And I'm sure you are. Can I just add, just add that yeah. love can start without knowledge. But it's even better with the knowledge. <laughs> Or maybe think, it's the reason why it does start. <laughs> I think also, I mean, I mean, beyond the terminology, we've had, I think people know what the feedback we have from consumers and especially sommeliers. I mean, sommeliers love that. The entree has really embraced it because they feel, uh, well, they can do it uh, on their own time. Uh, in their own house, so they don't have to actually show, you know, I've seen masters of wines going, oh my God, you know, I got everything wrong. So they go down, you know, to the next level. Uh, but they, they love it because it's fun, and at the end of the day, you know, they can do it without showing what they know, what they don't know, uh, while learning. So it's been, a, it's been a very, we've had some very good fee feedback about it. I think Patrick, you had a question? Oh, um, yes, the US market, so the US I'm not sure it's the first time because in, in history uh, uh, you have already seen the US uh, first in volume. Yes. This has happened a couple of times. 
Is it expanding? Is the has value? It extended, has it increased its lead on the UK? How fast has the um, fund raised? I would, I would think so, but we, we have not here the figures for the previous years. Have you used that somewhere? Yeah, we, we've got them. Uh, I've got it in my machine. <laughs> we can go uh, uh, over it afterwards. But uh, it's, yes, uh, there is, uh, uh, apart from the exchange rate effect, there is, uh, there is an interesting effect in the US market. Uh, also, uh, Which is not new. Uh, if, if that is your question, it's not new that the value per bottle that is imported by the United States has, has been higher than in the UK. You have also one of the explanations is that in the UK you have a lot of, I would say, relatively cheap champagne. Don't forget you have also the BOB market is of course very much at the entry price level. And each supermarket group have it here. You also have Lidl, you have a number of players at, a, at, the, at if I may say so, at the lower price end who are looking for less expensive wines. This doesn't exist in the United States. In the United States, you have uh, only the uh, real producers' brands. That's the first point, so they tend to be more expensive. And the second point is that you have a much bigger market share that is occupied by the more expensive cuvées, pr uh, primarily, of course, uh, prestige cuvées. And uh, one which is very well known, which I won't name, but you already, you, you, you already know. Uh, but it's part of the answer also is that in the US market, there may be more exporters, but in fact, the, the, the number one group has a bigger market share. That must be recognized. <laughs> the, the per capita figures are still in favor of the UK. Oh yeah, yeah. So they have a big mar progress margin. Please. Thomas? at the UK market, you see that uh, for Champagne, there is also a good dynamics. I mean, achieving such a growth in 2015 uh, with such a strong basis of consumption means that there is uh, strong interest in sparkling wines in the UK, especially in qualitative sparkling wines, and we, we are taking advantage of this trend, and uh, according to the channels of distribution, of course, uh, you have different sparkling wines in the market different offers, but I think we are uh, uh, occupying uh, the right place, the place where we need to be, which means value strategy, which means uh, 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 the right place for China. So you don't foresee any loss in market share with the number of UK vendors coming? Well, it's, it's not because Champagne is unique. That champagne is alone. As I said earlier, in the in the global figures, you we we know for very long that champagne only represents one bottle out of ten in volume of wines. Put it this way, with bubbles in the bottle. Uh, so we we if I mean we don't need to go very far. In France, you do hundred you you do even ten kilometers from the south of Champagne. You are in Bourgogne, where there is Crémant de Bourgogne. You do uh, 200 kilometers to the east, you have Crémant d'Alsace. You know, you know we, even in France, we, we are not the volume uh, leader in terms of, uh, say, globally sparkling wine. Uh, but Champagne is unique for other reasons, uh, which are a combination of uh, climate, uh, soil, uh, tradition, rules. Etc., which are very clear. Our rules, for instance, are very clearly on the table, you know, and I don't, don't know of many other regions in the world where the rules are so clear. For instance, take the, Amer the United States of America. As you know, this is one of the big issues we have in terms of recognition of Champagne as a geographic indication. Well, in America, the local law doesn't recognize Champagne as a GI which we are asking for, we have been asking for many, many years, but we will succeed, I'm sure, in the end, but for the moment, it's not the case. So you see all sorts of sparkling wines with uh, the name Champagne on the label, and it starts with the uh, wines you don't know where it comes from, you are not even sure it's made from grapes, and which is artificially carbonated, like uh, soda. 
This exists also in, in France, sparkling wines. Or then you have also a uh, Charmat process, cuve close, where it's fermented like beer in, under, under pressure in large tanks and bottled alongside, uh, and it takes only a couple of weeks to, to, to produce. Then you have, uh, finally, a method champenoise with the individual fermentation in the bottle as we do in Champagne, but not necessarily with the same rules in terms of yield or, or in terms of maturation, etc. etc. So, so um, to summarize, the offer of sparkling wine globally is, is huge, it's enormous. <coughs> We are small, we, we totally respect the others. Uh, we don't like them when, when, when they use our name, then we fight them. But the others who don't use our name, we, we have absolutely no problem. There is room for everybody. Yeah, yeah, the technically, Thanks, your sorry, question no. is about market share. But what is a relevant market? And uh, it shows that the sparkling category is an artificial category. It's a st statistical category and within which you have different categories which play in different markets. So it's, but uh, this is a technical complement to what Bruno was saying. I think, sorry, sorry, Nick, just Barry was being just then Nick. So, so now you have these wonderful digital tools. I was just wondering how innovative you want to be with them. Uh, as well as just testing for knowledge, there are other sensory things you can do. For example, the sound of champagne being poured into a glass is different from the sound of Prosecco, is different from the sound of club soda. You can test people, they're pretty good at it, at knowing which it is. So, so I would invite you to use more sensory engagement. But I was also wondering whether you're doing any monitoring, because now that you've got the digital tools of Champagne Campus, and you can see who's using it, you get figures about where it's being used. If you see any difference in the value figures or changes in the value figures, you might be able to peg it to what's going on and the use of that digital tool. So I think you know to join it up and give you much more insight into what drives changes in the market, what drives preferences. Well, it's clear that uh, digitalization is also a very good tool for us to add some knowledge about who is interested in our champagne all over the world where they are, what they are looking at. So we are starting to gather figures out of Champion Campus. We have some, but it's not relevant enough to, to make any comment on this, uh, uh, these figures at, uh, at this uh, stage. But uh, surely, we will, according to, to the first results, what we get out of Champion Campus, out of uh, 360, uh, we, we will have additional indications of how we need to communicate about Champion. One more question, maybe? Oh, you know, now everybody wants that. Okay, Nick. <laughs> well, one question about the United States. The United States is 48 markets. Is there any sign that genuine imported French champagne is now being sold right through the United States, or is it largely confined to the West Coast of the East Coast? 